Welcome everybody, welcome everybody on Zoom. We have a, an impressive Zoom uh, group around the globe. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and in some cases, good night uh, to those on, on Zoom. Uh, my name is Miles, for all my sins of which there are many, I'm a historian of science here at IAS. Um, and this is a physical therapy injury, so all the jokes say now and get it out because it is very pathetic. But uh, so just a few announcements. First of all, I should like to thank uh, S.T. Lee, uh, who gave a very generous endowment to the School of Historical Studies to bring in a superstar to give a lecture and then to fund a workshop thereafter. And it rotates between the faculty members and this time it's history of science. And because as all of my colleagues know, I like to blend history of science, history of medicine, history of technology, because I don't think there are epistemological, trans-temporal, trans-cultural definitions that separate them. And it's a hell of a lot more fun when we mix the fields. Um, and uh, we try to have it once a term. Of course, COVID did its best to thwart that, uh, but we're trying to slowly but surely get back on track. Francesca had, they had it last spring. Uh, so hopefully we'll be back to full speed very soon. Um, just a brief announcement. After lecture, there'll be a book signing. There's new, Jeremy has a new book on which he's based his talk. That's going to be in the New Rudenstein Commons, and there'll be a reception there as well. I was been told it's great food and great wine. That's it. Yeah, I would never lie to you. So uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's guest, Jeremy Green. He's the William H. Welch Professor and Chair of the Department of History and Medicine at Johns Hopkins University. Jeremy received an MA in Medical Anthropology from Harvard. Uh, and an MD, PhD degree, MD and a PhD degree in history of science from Harvard as well. His research explores the ways in which medical technologies come to influence our understandings of what it means to be sick or healthy, abnormal or normal on personal, regional and global scales. In addition to directing the Institute for the History of Medicine, he's the founding director of the Center for Medical Humanities and Social Medicine at Johns Hopkins, core faculty in Johns Hopkins Drug Access and Affordability Initiative, Associate Faculty at the Berman Institute of Bioethics, co-investigator in the Opioid Industry Documents Archive, the Black Beyond Data Project, and the Sawyer Seminar on Precision Uncertainty in a World of Data. He also holds joint appointments in the Department of the History of Science and Technology and the Department of Anthropology at the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences at Hopkins. Uh, this is his third and most recent book, The Doctor Who Wasn't There, Technology, History, and Limits of Telehealth, University of Chicago, 2022. It literally just came out. Um, and I was able to get advanced copies because I don't, I think it comes out, oh, I, did, I think it's officially out now, but we, this past month. Um, it examines how changing expectations of instantaneous communications through electric, electronic, and digital media transform the nature of medical practice and medical knowledge. His first two books, which appeared with Johns Hopkins University Press, prescribing by numbers, drugs, and the definition of disease and generic, the unbranding of modern medicine, describe how the relationship of knowledge science and the pharmaceutical marketplace and broader understandings of the relationship between medicine and public health can only be understood through understanding the complex histories of medical technologies like pharmaceuticals and the series of legislative, regulatory, clinical, and consumer decisions that guide the production, circulation, and consumption. His current research project is tentatively entitled Syringe Tide. That's a great title, right? As opposed to Roll Tide. Alabama might Oh, this is kind of like, hey, you're talking to me. I like that. Disposable technologies in the making of medical waste. It is about Jersey. Uh, focuses on how medical technology, <laughs> I'm, I'm from Patterson, I'm allowed to say that, became discarded and the urgency of understanding the ecological costs of wasteful medicine. His work has been recognized worldwide. Uh, he's recognized by the Roy Porter Award for the Society of Social History of Medicine, the J. Worth uh, Estes Award and the Richard uh, Shryrock Medal from the American Association for the History of Medicine, the Edward Kramer Award, uh, Kramer's Award for the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy, and the Rachel Carson Prize from the Society of the Social Studies of Science. Most recently, he was named in 2021 as Nicholas, Nicholas Davies Award recipient from the American College of Physicians for Outstanding Scholarly Activities in History, Literature, Philosophy, and Ethics, and Contributions to Humanism in Medicine. So further ado, I've taken way too much time, but he's worthy of the introduction. Jeremy, the floor is yours. Welcome to the board. Thanks. Thanks so much, Miles. It, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks, thanks to the Institute. Thanks to all of you for, um, for taking part in, in, in today's event. I seem to have a bit of a feedback loop here, which maybe this will take. Is that better? Maybe I'm just the only one here, but that's okay. 
Um, at any rate, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today and to share uh, the, this, this book, which we're just been launching into the world this past month, uh, The Doctor Who Wasn't There, Technology, History, and the Limits of Telehealth. And I, I want to say I have no conflict of interest that I know of in this topic, although I have been passing around an object that hopefully will make its round through the physical audience. Um, and I want to ask you a little bit about that. But, and as a historian of science, medicine, and technology, and as a practicing physician, my research has centered on communications technologies and the nature of medical thought for both patients and practitioners. And um, I, that object that I just sent you around is a key piece to a device called the ClinCloud. Have any of you seen or come into contact with the ClinCloud before this evening? So when I was beginning research on this project, so, um, but, but here, here's the device. And so, and, and I am not receiving any money from the clinic cloud information. But in 2015, when I was starting research on this project, the Silicon Valley Tech Crunch Disruptor event had a medical technology as its headline image. Um, the clinic cloud, which was a smartphone app that prompts direct by connectivity to a digital stethoscope and thermometer. And the object that I'm passing around right now, although it's a little sticky and it came that way in the box, um, is the, the Wi Fi digital thermometer that links up with your phone to produce these results. Um, and effectively, it promised connectivity via digital steps so that communicate key diagnostic information to the patient miles away. And in this moment of an ebullience for the new nature of things, the new forms of M health and E health that were being put forward again pre pandemic in 2015. The clinic lab was seen as a disruptive new technology to provide a break from the past. And it, it garnered $5 million in its round of first round funding, a featured contract from Best Buy, who was looking to set up basically a dock in the box at big box stores. Um, and, you know, the question I would ask the historian is, you know, how much of a break is this from the past? And, you know, I think everybody knows this about historians. We do this irritating thing where we regularly say this thing that you think is new is not as new as you think it was. But it really doesn't take too much effort to go back to the first few years after the demonstration of, of Bell's telephone before you start finding um, descriptions of telephonic stethoscope. And here's one uh, from 1910 published in Scientific American showing a stethoscope that could effectively be affixed on in place of a telephone relay that would then provide um, care at a distance, connectivity, the ability for someone in South Dakota to have their heart listened to by a cardiologist. So if you compare these two, I don't want you to just come away with the message that new media aren't new, but that old media are new as well. But you know, many of them fail, right? So the clinic cloud um, is not with us anymore. The clinic cloud, um, it, it, it was a darling new media that was predicted to have a future that would be so clearly connected um, in the lives of patients and providers across the world. But basically, um, within the past few years, um, the, the company folded, the, the, the market wasn't as robust as it was meant to be. And so many fail, Clinicow did, the te telephonic stethoscope of 1910 failed as well. And even the successful ones um, tend to fail to be recognized, they become invisible. And so this is what I want to get at today. Um, it's a theme that runs through the book, which is why it is that we learn to ignore communications technologies and media of medicine, whether they are successful or whether they fail. Right? In the moment of newness, the new media become actually quite visible and talked about. But when they either become accepted and widespread or fall apart and get discarded, we tend to erase them. Um, so they, this, this led to a conference that we held in Johns Hopkins back in 2017, along with my colleague, Gianna Pamata, on how um, older media um, promised to reshape medical care or reshape the formation and circulation of scientific and medical knowledge from the telephone to the radio to the television, to the early networks computer. And ultimately that's the basis of the four sections of this book. The first part is about the telephone and how the telephone inspired new visions of care at a distance. And the second part is on wireless communication. So what could make, how, how could the new technology of FM radio promise to make bodies speak at a distance and render possible telemetry and, and a wireless physiology that could help emanations from the body be recorded in real time without disturbing physiological functions? Or alternately, you know, what could the wireless pager do for the accountability of care? And this is now a largely a museum piece, but the pager had longevity. It really stayed within medical practice well into the 21st century. 
medical practice helped to define what the wireless pager would be and what, what its value was in American society. And medicine held on to pagers for a long time. The third part, um, which is perhaps the most self-evident aspect, is the coining of the terms telemedicine and telehealth. As television, especially cable television, was seen as a technology of immediate and, and continuous um, and, uh, and constant communications that would actually break down barriers of accessibility, um, whether rural or urban, physical geography and social geography in the 1960s and 1970s. And this is the part that I'm going to focus today's talk on. It's really the core set of chapters at the center of the book about the promise of communications technologies in democratizing access to healthcare, and then to ask actually what happens with that. So today's talk focuses on those, on, on those means. The last part of the book is about the early computer and the promise of networked computing to render all of medical knowledge instantaneously available and to help make diagnostic thinking algorithmically producible and reproducible in systems which would not require the presence of the doctor. And we can get to these other parts in the Q&A if you like, but for today I want to ask about the limited process of these technologies, which is to say, can the right technology undo widening disparities in access to healthcare? And do we believe it can and should? Um, telemedicine, which so many of us have been rocketed into in the context of the recent and current pandemic, was initially promoted as a tool to reduce disparities in healthcare, um, a theme that many are still working to achieve today. We've just had a conference at Johns Hopkins just, um, just a few weeks ago on this topic, and partly because, as so many of us have learned, the deployment of telehealth in the COVID-19 pandemic, in many cases, widened disparities to access to care rather than resolving them. So if you take me, you know, I, I see patients once a week in a community health center in East Baltimore. I was there yesterday and um, <laughs> that's just gonna vex me. That's all right. I, I, um, I find that uh, yesterday's clinic was odd in that it was one of the first clinics I've had in a while in which there were no telemedical encounters. So every patient that I saw yesterday was actually there with me in clinic. What I've been dealing with and what I think most practitioners of medicine have been dealing with lately is the challenging phenomena of the hybrid clinic where some of the patients that I will see in my clinic are there, they're in the waiting room, they're physically, they're impatient waiting for me to see them. And I know that they will or will not show up depending on if a flag goes up or down. Um, but then there's other patients that are just waiting in these, this non-space of the ether. And it's hard for me to pivot back and forth between in presence real pre and um, and telepresence. Um, and yet, in the early days of the pandemic, all of the access to our clinic, which and our clinic is a safety net facility, we provide a sliding scale fee, we will not turn any person away from receiving care. Um, it was it was founded um, in response to the 1968 uprising in Baltimore as a as a actually a form of community action from the East Baltimore um, Community Corporation, which is a group of East Baltimore activists to produce accessible health care that was community owned, largely for um, a largely African American population that was living in public housing that bordered on the edge of the, the site where my clinic is now. And so over time, especially with the growing Latinx population in Baltimore, um, the safety net institution has become a very important resource for obtaining care for uninsured and, many, and undocumented and un ultimately in the context of the United States system, occasionally uninsurable patients who can still nonetheless come and walk in the door and be seen in this urgent care clinic and get enrolled into primary care. So what happens in this context in which suddenly in-person care disappears um, and, the, the, and, the, and, this, and all care shifted to telehealth? So rather than being equally accessible to all patients in my clinic, right, the telehealth suite was very, very difficult to get into if you were somebody who would have, in another day, a week earlier, been walking into the front door and trying to figure out a way to be seen through a safety net institution. So telehealth quickly exacerbated disparities in access to care. And this wasn't just my own observation. In, in, in other cities, there's, here's results from, from Boston, from New York City, finding that Many, if you look at folks who get full access to telehealth suites, there's a steep dis uh, differential um, along, along, um, just along uh, gradients of age, race, 
ethnicity um, and income. And so here's a little bit of data from, from Baltimore. This has been Hopkins' attempt to address this problem, at least be more conscious of it. So here's up in the top blue is the 21210 um, uh, neighborhood. This is where I live, where I sort of wake up in the morning and when I drive or bike down to my clinic in 21213, showing on the one hand still some of these steep forms of segregation that are you know, very spatially visible in the city of Baltimore. Now, if you look at self-designated race, self-designated uh, ethnicity, again, using these very crude cate census categories of black, white, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, you see very different profiles, right? Racially, um, ethnically, by income level of these neighborhoods. And what this graph is showing you here is the extent to which a proportion of patients that were only able to access telephone th access telehealth through a telephone alone, which is to say, if the full telemedical suite was not visible, um, and you see here in 21210 in Roland Park, um, you see 10% of, of all ages would be, be receiving their visit by, by, by phone alone, um, compared to 41%. If you look at the, at the elderly population over 65, the difference is between 12 and 58%. So basically suggesting that access to the full telehealth suite, um, that there's, there's, this is one form as many other forms of data, was just not equally laid out to all comers. So, you know, in my own telemedical experience in the first year of the pandemic, there was this tight correlation between white race, non-Hispanic ethnicity, and non-Medicaid insurance status, and the ability to successfully establish telemedical encounters. And this has been borne out in a number of cohort studies. And in turn, the pandemic became a boom time for concierge models of care explicitly built on proprietary telemedical platforms. There's membership fees of these organizations. Again, I have no financial relationship with partner MD, and they're just one of many concierge models of care that sold telemedical access as part of what one gained through the subscription package of paying for a concierge model of care. And so as a historian, I found a paradox here, right? If you go back to the origins of telemedicine in the late 60s and 70s, this technology promised to remove the barriers of time and space, to remove the social geographic problems of access to healthcare, to undo social disparities in access to healthcare. And yet in the present pandemic, it seemed to be doing exactly the opposite, accelerating and underlining these differences. So the first theme of this lecture, I know that's a bit of time to get to the first theme of the lecture. It does telemedicine eliminate health disparities or augment them? And even before telemedicine existed as a real practice, it existed as an imaginary means to eliminate geographic barriers of access to healthcare. And we think a lot about speculative futures in the history of science, medicine, and technology. And here is one, for example, uh, Fritz Kahn, uh, the, the brilliant German Jewish medical illustrator in this 1939 image titled The Doctor of the Future, using radio and television to give a consultation to his patient aboard the ship India in the South Seas. And it's a kind of aestheticized techno-futurism that we're all familiar with, right? It's um, showing that information technology can bring people closer and remove problems of distance and time lag and provide seamlessness in care. But I mentioned aesthetics to name the second theme of today's lecture, that all of us, right, in the past few years have become scholars and practitioners of telepresence with every next Zoom meeting or rapid sort of shift from Zoom to in-person or in-person to Zoom or back, we also understand the aesthetic and affective dimensions that these practices have on our lives. And so if you think for a moment about the design of the Zoom cream, the screen, the ergonomics of the moments when we, the new forms of neck spasms that we learn to live with or shoulder spasms, these are ontologically novel forms of pathology that are associated with these new communications technologies, right? So we're, we're tend to be used to success stories of design and technology, how good design overcomes initial hesitation in embracing new technology. And this is captured well in John Harwood's um, 2011 book, uh, the, Inter the Interface, uh, History of Design at IBM, that describes how IBM, under the leadership of Thomas Watson Jr.'s slogan, good design is good business, overcame initial critiques of unfeeling automation to generate more ways to speed the acceptance of computing in business and personal life. But, um, aesthetics works both ways, right? So many encounters with new technologies produce a sense of aesthetic and affective disconnect. And this is suggested in one cartoon here to critiquing bedside manner through the Bell picture phone, another failed communication with technology for whom medical uses was seen as a necessary way in which the Bell picture phone was supposed to be a part of our everyday lives. So today's talk is gonna examine these 
questions of presence and absence, what is gained and what is lost, what are the affective disconnects in, in, these, um, in these forms of telepresence? Because not everyone embraced this promise of telemedicine. And over the course of the decade, various stakeholders invested in rolling out telemedicine in the medium in the 60s and 70s, doctors, nurses, engineers, health systems planners, um, community organizers and sociologists, they all struggled to understand the negative affect and suspicion with which many users, doctors and patients alike, recoiled from the screen instead of embracing it. Um, so what all these thinkers wanted to know, did television do to the medical encounter? How could this interface be better designed to tune out the uncanny feelings of disconnection, of disaffection that telepresence brought with it? So the remainder of this talk is gonna do two things. The first is to explore three themes in theorizing telepresence that came out in this first decade of telemedicine in the 60s and 70s. Um, the initial, the concerns of adopters, and second, to explore the social engineering of doctor-patient relations and telepresence, paying attention to the use of different kinds of lenses and screens and stages, and third, to explore other forms of discomfort that lay not in the dehumanizing potential of telemedicine, but rather in the liberating potential in which it might give too much agency to patients. And this is something that many doctors feared. And then second, to understand how telehealth was specifically rolled out in the 60s and 70s as a technological fix to social disparities in access to healthcare in a way that referenced both the, refer the racialized concept of a medical ghetto, which was a term of art at the time, as they became understood during Americans' urban crisis of white flight, as well as the barriers of access to rural health as they became understaffed due to the flight of people and capital to urban and suburban America in the late 20th century. So, you know, it, uh, this, it, it's a decent amount to take on, but we'll, we'll, I first want to get at this concept of enhancement. So the clinic and the space in which the term telemedicine is invented is this, this shop front, which is a gate at Logan Airport, gate 23, in 1968, where a small satellite clinic for the Massachusetts General Hospital is set up at the request of the hospital president, John Knowles. Now, Dr. Kenneth Bird, shown here, and another clinician staffed the clinic in person during peak travel hours and telephone call by pager the rest of the time to the nurses who staffed the clinic on a 24-hour basis. And these limitations of doing medicine by telephone, of trying to understand for someone like Bird sitting in the emergency department at Mass General Hospital, what was happening through a telephone description of a patient at a gate in Logan Air Force soon became apparent. And Bird had been reading the popular media theorist Marshall McLuhan, was convinced of the value of television as a new electronic extension of man, and sought to extend the diagnostic capacity of urgent care nurses and physicians by adding a, a closed loop of interactive television. Put two cameras and two televisions into a loop, and then you can see the patient. He added a set of closed circuit TV cameras between Logan and MGH, long lenses for portraits, macro lenses for close-ups, special adapters for EKGs, x-rays, and microscopes, and created effectively a media lab for doing medicine remotely. Now, all of this information fed from this experimental clinic at Logan Airport into the console of a physician back at the main hospital in a special alcove talked off the emergency department. And when the clinic opened in April of 1968, it was headline news. There's the Boston Globe reported, quote, the doctors are never more than a few feet away from their patients, even though the latter are at the airport and the doctors are at the hospital downtown. Alternately, as a third year medical student at Harvard Medical School rotating to the clinic described it, in Bird's clinic, the doctor's stethoscope is three miles long. Now, if this imagery of telepresence invokes a form of science fiction in the present, that's the present. That's no accident, right? The medical student in question, Michael Crichton, was already a celebrated science fiction author. And just a year earlier, his first novel, The Andromeda Strain, had been published to critical acclaim and optioned as a blockbuster movie in the emerging genre of a biomedical thriller. So Crichton, at the time, though, was already at work on his second book, Five Patients, which devoted a chapter to the science fiction already present in the contemporary practice of the medical station at Gate 23. So like Crichton, Bird saw this clinic as a form of science fiction in the present, describing these jet-setting patient populations as denizens of the future, people in the airport who already embraced a technological sublime. But this mediation of medicine by television came with perils as well as promises. Bird and his chief technical collaborator, the CBS television engineer Stanley Cranin, focused extraordinary attention on problems of image fidelity. How could you know 
If a doctor could see a lesion in the blood vessels of an eye in person, would that same lesion be visible to another doctor looking at the eye on the television several miles away? And this image above, and there's hundreds of images like this in Bird's files at MGH, shows um, a photograph of a television screen that depicts an image of the conjunctiva of a model patient at two different camera settings. So this is taped onto a piece of paper in a scrapbook, a photograph of a television screen showing the eye and showing what lesions you can and can't see. And these images constitute the corpus of exhausted experiments into um, what they consider to be a science of similarity. How do you show that the care you get, the diagnostic acumen you get at a, good, at a distance is good enough? Um, now, Crane and Bird went on to assay visual capacities and limitations of all these different lenses and video enhancement algorithms, the ability to distinguish key features on microscopic, radiological, or physical examinations. And in the early 70s, Bird, along with the telemedical nurse practitioner, Marie Kerrigan, who's shown here in these images to the right, began to theorize more broadly on the meanings of television medicine for practitioner and patient. So in a telemedical circuit, they suggest, quote, interactive television allows interpersonal communication across distances to recreate and even enhance face-to-face -face communication. So I wanna linger on this notion of enhancement, which is the theme I started on here because they believe that this telemedical circuit is not just good enough, but could produce better medicine. It quote, produces an alteration in time and space, which actually expands the role of the physician. In fact, the fundamental doctor-patient relationship is not only preserved, but often is actually augmented, enhanced, and seemingly more critically focused. Now this augmentation was not necessarily a good thing to all parties. So by the early 1970s, a few other clinics had also attempted to set up staff meetings using the television at the head of a table to actually have a staff be monitored remotely by a physician at a distance. So clinic staff begin to complain that the supersized heads of the consulting physician at the head of the table created what they called a face of God problem, right? The relative power of physicians, I'm not seeing, I'm adjust this so you can see that better. Um, the relative power of physicians was also augmented in a way that made clinic staff feel uncomfortable so that the medium itself could accentuate power relation differences between doctors and their staff. And what the staff did, what the nurses and medical assistants at this clinic did to resolve this problem was to actually take the television off the wall and place it down on the floor so that they could look down at the physician rather than up. And I wanna linger on this because this, this observation, when it was studied in, in initial analysis of telemedicine by the Rockefeller Foundation, um, suggested that, that actually these problems of social relations between doctors and nurses and staff could be resolved by technical means. You could just physically change the interface and then you undo a power relation and reformat it. And it leads to a set of problems, a set of exuberance, but also a set of problems of the kind of problems that telemedicine could fix. So I wanna focus here on two figures. One is the media studies scholar, Ben Park, who wrote an influential report on telemedicine for the Rockefeller Foundation. And then a health technology analyst, Maxine Rockoff, who is heading up an office for the federal government evaluating the role of telehealth technologies in public health. And the two of them became fascinated with the distortions that emerged when telepresence offered too much rather than not enough, this face of God problem. So in June of 1973, the two of them meet in New York with Park's longtime friend, Irving Goffman, to see if the famous sociologist could help them understand what was happening and what was not happening in videotapes of televised doctor-patient encounters. And Rockoff had read Goffman's presentation of self in everyday life, considered the Penn sociologist to be one of the country's leading experts on person-to-person -person communication. And they taped more than six hours of conversations with Goffman about what telepresence meant. And so Goffman suggested one of the problems of establishing presence in telemedical encounters was the fact that these two figures, right, the doctor and patient, didn't share the same environment. And when two people communicate in the same room, um, Rockoff recorded in her notes of the meeting, their backgrounds also communicate and they share the same communication space. We've developed a code for handling such things as a third person walking into a room, Goffman continued, the need to look at reference material or notes, and a new code will have to be developed for television interactions. For example, you know, when it, so 
a, a 30 second interruption can seem very long from the perspective of someone who's waiting in the ether while their physician is talking to an unknown person in the room. So these kinds of encounters, you know, led to other framing problems that telehealth brought on. And one of the famous framing problems was a parallax problem that occurs with cameras and monitors. And I think we all know this. I think for the Zoom audience, you know, we can, we can talk about this explicitly, right? Like eye contact is understood by medical practitioners and medical sociologists to be crucial for establishing rapport in difficult clinical situations. But coupling a television with a camera has this problem, right? You can either look at the camera, which I think in this room is somewhere over there, or you can look at the screen. Um, and so if you're trying to talk to somebody, like where do you look, right? Do you look into their eyes on the image or do you look into the camera or do you just sort of shiftily glance back and forth between the two of them? But whichever it was, you know, it created technical problems of establishing intimacy through these gaze. Um, now the sociological staging of intimacy was recast as a technical problem of framing. Could we solve this problem by just actually having a better engineered studio set and what other problems could that studio set solve? So when discussing the face of God problem above, Ben Park invoked the work of another anthropologist, Edward Hall, who had introduced a social theory of proxemics in 1966 in a, in a popular book called The Hidden Dimension. Have, have any of you engaged with proxemics and Hall? It's interesting, I, I gave, I gave a, 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 an early talk on this book in, um, in Taiwan, and it was actually a standard part of the medical curriculum in Taiwan was to study proxemics. But like Goffman, Hall was attuned to the social study of everyday life, and he specifically drew attention to the everyday spatial frames of closeness and distance that helped to code intimacy in commonplace social interactions. So among white middle-class Americans, Hall described four distances of social interaction, intimate, personal, social, and public, each with a close phase and a far phase. And these could be coded precisely in units of length, right? So social far phase at seven to 12 feet is a space of formal business and social interaction. Personal far phase at 2.5 to four feet is an arm's length distance for discussing sensitive material. Intimate far phase is six to 18 inches, which if you're that close, and I could kind of do it in a Zoom call, you know, causes visual distortions and eye crossing. But so this idea that you take the distance of a camera from a doctor to patient, the choice of a wide angle or a close up lens, that on the one hand, they all introduced the problem of incorrect distance. Like if you, you couldn't establish intimacy if the framing of your apparent distance was, was wrong. On the other hand, they, offer, they offered the possibility to socially engineer intimacy by creating the correct framing. So at what apparent distance Park asked, does the physician cease to be a friendly symbol of help and become over domineering or even a threat? Now, I've, I've started off with the physician and creator of the term telemedicine, Kev, Kenneth Bird, hoping that a new media of telemedicine would lead to a more augmented role for doctors in American healthcare. And Park and other sociologists and media theorists thought that proxemics could help to engineer telepresence to be more productive and less suspicious. But he thought there was also a possibility to do something more radical. And Goffman and Park and Rockoff pro proposed two options to deal with the framing problems caused by telepresence. You could either change the nature of the camera work or setting to help reproduce a shared setting of the, back of the doctor's office. Or, quote, we may choose to take advantage of the technology to develop new forms of interacting. So disrupting the shared background was not necessarily a bad thing, they argued, if it helped to disrupt the asymmetry in power relations between doctor and patient, an asymmetry that's controlled in part by the space of the clinic and the doctor's office, which I think any of us who have experienced physically being in a clinic, you know, sitting on a table with a paper gown open in the back, like that is a space that is engineered precisely to produce an asymmetry in power. And so the idea that telepresence and telemedicine might have subversive potential by actually separating these spaces and giving patients more agency in their own encounters. So in the telemedicine setting, Park noted, the situation can be restored to considerably greater symmetry because the environment, though shared, consists of two spaces. The patient may respond to this greater symmetry in a positive way by showing greater candor and being more relaxed. And some early results coming out of a pilot telemedical project linking a public housing project in East Harlem with physicians in the nearby Mount Sinai Hospital suggested that some patients felt more comfortable on screen than they did in person in a medical center. And 
Goffman points out that a similar change in power relations takes place in the right to touch, right? So in a clinical encounter, the doctor can touch the patient, but the patient can't necessarily touch the doctor in the same way. And in fact, if that happens, that often, you know, this leads to co the calls to security and there's a very, you know, clear sort of policing of these relations that takes place in the space of the clinic. But television, as Goffman points out, restores symmetry to the world of touching, right? Because neither party can touch each other. And so this idea that telemedicine would disrupt power asymmetries in the doctor-patient relationship was a far cry from Kenneth Bird's original goals in which television was meant only to augment and amplify, right? Never to diminish the role of a physician in medical encounters. But Bird would have been relieved perhaps to know that other sociologists, especially Elliot Friedson, who was also intervened and in, in heavily engaged in early telemedical um, studies, developed, um, and Friedson, is, is very well known for this work, Doctoring Together, a study of professional social control. And his body of work used the medical profession as a way of understanding how professions and other social groups develop and maintain social control. And thought that Park and Rockoff's hopes for the capability of television to restore symmetry was really just, just frankly overstated, right? Writing to Park, Friedson notes, quote, it seemed to me that telemedicine makes it possible for everything to be prepped in advance so that doctor can simply come in like a surgeon and do purely functional work. I'm not sure I would argue there's greater symmetry between a doctor and a patient under these circumstances. If I'm right, this is indeed a selling point to doctors, particularly the super specialists who like to make use of every minute to perform their esoteric functions. But I'm not exactly sure that this is the best thing in the world for human patient care. And so as telemedicine became a tool with disruptive potential in the eyes of some sociologists and patient advocates, it was also recognized to be also a tool for clamping down professional control. So the technology itself is relatively agnostic to the power relations that it finds itself within. Technology could simultaneously be invoked as liberatory or as a further means of repression. And all of these studies, I wanna contextualize these sort of sociological hopes for what this technology could do to power relations in medicine was also recognized to be a very American set of concerns. And more specifically in the limitations of social sciences, especially medical sociology at the time, a very white middle-class American set of concerns. So at the end of this 1974 report on telemedicine, Park briefly reflects on the limitations of the social framework that he and Goffman and Friedson and others have been using as something limited, like so much of the early 70s sociological imagination, to a typical doctor-patient interaction, which assumed a white middle-class American consumer of healthcare. So not only did this lead to bias in the cultural dimensions of telemedical practice, these norms were then built into the interface itself. So even the physical structure of the telemedical systems are predicated on white middle-class American usage. Park notes the red bias of the Plumacon cameras which are the cameras that were installed in tele telemedical systems, which not only favored light skin tones over dark skin tones, but also detected inflammation on light skin with a different sensitivity compared to detection of inflammation of darker skin tones. So existing disparities in access to health, he warned, could be augmented through differential access to a telemedical system designed with white middle-class bodies, minds, social groups, and behaviors in mind. If cultural and ethnic differences can, and indeed often do, make for difficulties in the face-to-face -face interactions between physicians and patients, he concludes. Does this interactive medium have potential for creating different difficulties? Will people from different disadvantaged socioeconomic groups, and here I'm using Park's language, e.g. ghetto blacks, reservation Amerinds, and Spanish-speaking poor, result in problems or opportunities for providing care? Now, I want to contextualize Park's language here because we can and should critique the terms he is using in his analysis. And yet at the same time, they still mesh very closely onto the limited tools of analysis that we have for even performing the analytics of Baltimore neighborhoods and access to telemedicine that I presented through these crude census categories of recording black, white, ethnicity becomes Latinx or non-Latinx. So in the time that I have left, I wanna pause um, and I want to come back to the common refrain of those terms, ghetto blacks, reservation Amerinds, and Spanish-speaking poor, because they reflect a common refrain that health disparities between black and white, between Latino and non-Latino, and on and off of indigenous or American Indian reservations were clearly understood to be the products of centuries of socially produced disparities. But the hope all the same was that telehealth technologies could flatten those boundaries in access to health care. And this hope 
we might look at as a naive form of hope, but I wanna reimagine the kind of technological possibility with which it was invested. Um, so the term ghetto had by the late 1960s undergone a radical transformation from describing the isolation of Jewish populations to being firmly associated with African-American and Latino marginalization, specifically in urban areas marked by white flight, this newly pathologized inner city. And John Norman, shown here on the left, one of the first black cardiothoracic surgeons um, and a member of the 1969 Harvard Medical School Committee on Relations with the Black Community, described in his own book that year, Medicine in the Ghetto, then that a medical ghetto that affected communities and practitioners alike needed to be understood as a fundamental framing of a medical segregation, healthcare segregation, producing disparities in outcome. Norman's colleague, John Holloman, a New York-based physician and civil rights activist who criticized famously the racist exclusion of African-Americans from the American Medical Association that was still in practice in 1968, noticed that there was a tendency here for, quote, many ghetto residents to view the establishment of satellite clinics um, in neighborhood health centers and the like with some suspicion. Often when we look about us, it is very easy to discern the correlation between interest where none existed before in our community and the large sums of monies available for study, demonstration, and renewal. So wary as he was of the concept of demonstration projects that focused on inner city areas and pathologized the ghetto and its denizens, Holloman nonetheless held out hope that telemedicine might produce new forms of community responses to an enduring social problem. He repeatedly pointed to the emerging technology of telemedicine as a possible solution to health disparities insisting, quote, that two-way closed circuit TV can be established to link the ghetto physician to the medical center, services that can be put into operation almost at once. So Holloman had become head of the public hospitals in New York City at a time when the New York State enacted a ghetto medicine program to fund ventures linking academic hospitals to inner city areas. The building here, the Wagner Homes Project at East Harlem, became a site for a federally funded telemedical link to the Mount Sinai Hospital to demonstrate the role of this technology in expanding access to inner city black and Latino patients in Harlem. And it was headed by a second generation African-American physician in the Mount Sinai Department of Community Medicine, Carter Marshall. And Marshall is aware that many East Harlem residents often resisted setting foot in the hospital until they were so ill as to be beyond the reach of medical help. And he hoped that the right kind of communications platform could help bring them into care at an earlier stage of illness and at an earlier stage of life. Marshall envisioned this pediatric outreach project that would reach directly from communication centers in Mount Sinai Hospital into clinics that were based in the structure of Harlem's tenements and public housing projects using medical television. So Marshall had written a 1972 book on dynamics of health and disease, which details again, the complex social factors that lead to disparities of access and healthcare in the inner city. Quote, there are two ways you can look at problems that involve the delivery of health services, Carter told the New York Times, shortly after establishing the first Harlem telemedical link between Mount Sinai and a community health center in the Wagner Homes Project. One of them is to fix the structure of the healthcare system itself, the other is to use technology to circumvent these fundamental problems. Our interest here, he continued, is how we can adapt technology to the delivery of health services regardless of the organizational framework. So technology can short circuit entrenched social problems in this vision, right? Marshall was very happy to find that many children and parents were immediately receptive to getting direct medical care over the television. Um, the children love it, he told the New York Times, and are even more willing to come to the clinic now that they can be on television. And in an early report to the National Cable Television Association, the Mount Sinai team explained plans to expand this cable link to other health stations, schools, daycare centers, and ultimately, hopefully, into every home in Harlem. So the Wagner Homes Project was announced as a success story. Um, a project which as a demonstration was viable. And it showed, quote, tech television can overcome the socio-cultural gulf that separates inner city residents from healthcare resources. But if the real goal was to provide good care to as many urban residents as possible, some studies suggested that television itself was less important as a technology than as a means of enabling other practitioners, specifically nurse practitioners, to operate more autonomously in neighborhood community health centers. So imagining a network of five Harlem clinics linked to a central consultant at the Mount Sinai Hospital, the economist Charlotte Muller from this project calculated each link would take 5% of the supervising physician's time, allowing 20 nurse practitioners 
and 20 clinics to be supervised by a single full-time physician. And Muller argued that the flesh and blood nurse practitioner had more to do with overcoming this distance than the televised physician themselves. So what was important with the television was not specifically the advice that could be given, but that the televisual link allowed nurse practitioners to function autonomously. But by the time Muller's analysis is published in 1977, the television link between Mount Sinai and Wagner Homes has already been shut down. So by 75, this federal contract is complete, having proved the efficacy of telecommunications with nurse practitioners. The National Center for Health Service Research dryly noted that as a successful demonstration project, this project has gone about as far as it can go. So without political will for implementation, a demonstration is just a demonstration. And this is all the, also the case with one of the most successful federal demonstrations of telemedicine for addressing rural health disparities in this time. And I realize we're a little tight on time, so I'm not gonna describe it in too much detail, but this took telemedicine on the road, literally, in a souped up Winnebago, retrofitted by NASA and Lockheed engineers. So the hump you may have noticed on the top of it is a satellite dish fitted for microwave communications. Open the door and you're surrounded by levers, switches, remote control camera monitors, and self-correcting sensor devices built to spec for NASA by the Aerospace and Defense Contractor Lockheed Missile and Space Company. And this is the Starpack Mobile Health Unit, a prototype mobile health unit with telemedical technologies designed to deliver state-of-the-art healthcare in out-of-the-way places. Now, Starpack, some of you may have heard about, it was short for Space Technology Applied to Rural Papago Advanced Healthcare, it represented an unusual collaboration between NASA, the Indian Health Service, and the Lockheed Missile and Space Corporation between 1973 and 1977. It was the largest single federal investment in telemedicine um, and the sparse landscape of the Papago Reservation in Southern Arizona, now known as the Tohono O'odham Reservation, where most residents lived several hours drive away from the nearest health post, became a testing site for adapting medical technologies that were planned for long-term manned space flight. So effectively, um, looking past the Apollo program towards a Mars shot, but then what ultimately becomes the medical bay of the space shuttle, there's a recognition among NASA that longer term telemedical technologies need to be developed to allow for long term manned space flight. And um, media coverage at the time made this comparison between Indian and astronaut explicit, emphasizing that common environments of absence and isolation prompted similar problems for the Papago a people, quote, as isolated from medical care as if they lived on the moon. And this NASA mobile health unit basically took the, the, what would become the medical bay of the space shuttle, stuffed it inside this Winnebago, drove it on predetermined routes through the Sonora Desert on the Tonotham Reservation, and allowed for a test which ultimately vetted and cleared the, the sick bay for the new space shuttle. But the patients that entered found themselves inside of this high-tech vehicle linked to a command center with cutting, tele te cutting edge telehealth equipment, relayed through powerful new communications and computer systems that were actually fabricated, designed, and built and, ma and managed themselves by Tono Odham technicians um, that connected the mobile health unit to live consultation with doctors stationed at a medical command center back at the Indian Health Service Hospital at the center of the reservation. So this system, just in brief, is a mobile unit with paramedical personnel connected by telecommunications to a medical command center that was a terrestrial test of the medical system being designed for the first space shuttle. Lockheed was interested in selling it as part of a technological aid package to developing nations and had contracts they thought lined up with USAID. Um, and it was sold to the Indian Health Service as a way of using technology to reduce disparities in access to care in out of the way rural areas. Now, I don't have time to tell the full Starpack story here. The impressive thing about it, and I also wanna thank my co-authors, um, Victor Breitberg um, and Gabrielle Maya Bernadette, who collectively, um, we, the three of us did a research project together, focusing on trying to recover a history of Starpack and agency and technological development among Tono Otham. But it worked, like the Harlem demonstration project. Both of these worked quite well at generating patient and provider acceptance, at generating communi uh, community acceptance, and broadly at demonstrating that quality care could be developed through telemedical means. From NASA's perspective, it was a successful demonstration and the space shuttle project moves forward with a new medical bay. Um, for a few years, the Indian Health Service could claim its own R&D office was at the forefront of applying space age technologies to real world public health problems with real possibilities for domestic and international acceptance. But Starpec leaves a mixed record of success and failure for the Papago tribe as well. 
Some of the nearly $4 million budget supported enduring infrastructural projects and the roads that were built still persisted. Yet while StarPAC did provide Odom, Odom living in remote villages more convenient access to healthcare services, it could not contribute a lasting solution to the persistent problem of coordinating medical services and communicating medical information on the reservation. So what happens to StarPAC after the federal funding dries up? Well, the, the mobile health unit itself is actually sold to another univer a university in Northern um, Arizona, where it's then used by the media club to televise football games. Um, and the, um, the, meanwhile, the, um, the radio towers that are set up are then contracted to the, um, to, to the, to the border patrol. Um, and as Arizona develops as a flagship um, telemedical uh, project, Arizona Telemedical Project out of the University of Arizona is one of the leading telemedicine projects in the country in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, um, there's no link that is left to the Tono Odom Reservation. And so it's only very recent, actually, in many ways, we want to the pandemic that telemedical possibilities have become reemerged for the Odom Nation. So both of these projects, right, the Wagner Homes Project in East Harlem, the Starpack Project in Southern Arizona, they both worked, right? They both involved imaginaries of creating a better world through more equitable access to healthcare through the promissory basis of telemedical technologies. They demonstrated that primary care could be delivered and offer real benefits to previously marginalized populations. But they both failed as well, right? And that neither of them lived past this demonstration phase. And direct investment in telemedicine as a system of reducing barriers to care dries up. Um, so in the interim, as telehealth has developed, it's become increasingly a private affair, an area of speculative capital and market development, rather than a coordinated program to ensure a public health, a public right to health for all. Yes, telehealth has increased access to healthcare for millions of Americans, especially in rural areas over the past several decades. But this is perhaps one of the most uncomfortable aspects of histories of telepresence and telehealth and the promise of equity through medical technologies is that it's stated only briefly in the archives I'm working with, but a system that promises increased access to healthcare actually contained within its very structure forms of racial and ethnic bias that work to increase rather than decrease disparities in access to healthcare. In the United States, with the increased uptake in telemedical care in the present pandemic, we found this uncomfortable truth amplified. And although there are many sincere efforts, certainly Johns Hopkins, the, the, the data that I'm showing you earlier comes out of a, a decided effort in trying to bend digital tools to promote greater health equity. It takes a lot of work to make sure that these tools which hold promise of democratizing access to care actually do so. And so in retrospect, there seems to be a kind of fundamental disconnect between these two halves of my talk, which I wanna suggest is a fundamental problem of disconnect and the kind of hopes that we place in communications technologies as democratizing access to healthcare, right? that the, the kinds of things people are trying to structurally engineer into telemedicine with attention to framing, distance, set design, use of lenses, a kind of a sociology of symmetry or asymmetry and power relations, it, 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 it didn't mesh with this belief that this technology could magically overwrite the steep social determinants that map out geographies of access and lack of access to healthcare in this country today. So in this first decade of telemedicine, which I've kind of plucked out of the center of the book for you, I wanna suggest that both on an interpersonal level in the kind of sociology of how we understand the, the attempts to socially engineer better doctor-patient relations through the engineering of telemedical sets and this larger scale engineering of how one can engineer democratizing of access to healthcare through this promissory technology. In neither case does the technology alone deliver what is promised in this iterative projection of the uncomfortable aspects of a telemedical interface. We see very clearly they make different parties uncomfortable for different technical, sociological, professional, and aesthetic reasons. So to wrap this up and to thank you for your attention today, I wanna to suggest that as we face a new set of promissory futures for the technologies of telepresence, especially the invocation of AI in this space today, and the relentlessly telepresent present or hybrid present that we find ourselves in now, it's worth pausing for a moment at the combined efforts of physicians, engineers, and sociologists to address these potentials and pitfalls of these interfaces because the interface itself remains malleable, right? The interface 
of a medical media, whether we're talking about a telephone call, whether we're talking about electronic health record, whether we're talking about AI algorithms that we are, 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 are deeply uneasy about, still is a malleable front. And the question is who is really at the table in designing this interface? Who's the who, and who holds the pokers to the fire really in ensuring that early promises of new technologies in leveling playing fields and producing equity and access are actually followed through and made up. So I wanna suggest that even this history sees many failed promises. None of these original efforts were naive in their belief that a new technology might hold the possibility of creating a more equitable world. The challenge is in believing that the technology alone will do so. So thank you so much for your attention today. I look forward to your questions. So I thought there was a microphone that looked like it was. Thank you. That, that was a really fascinating talk. Um, and I, I just wanted to uh, go back to COVID um, because uh, it, it seemed like in, in the first two examples, or at least in, in the health service example, there was some uh, government funding to try to, uh, to democratize health. Um, and as I'm looking back on what we did for telephone during COVID, it seems very much um, uh, that it's focused on uh, things that were more bureaucratic or regulatory, allowing, uh, allowing uh, physicians to, uh, to charge you know, similar fees, et cetera. What was done actually by the U.S. government to try to uh, uh, improve access to health during COVID or via telephone? Was there any effort to, to use telemedicine to actually uh, encourage greater access to health by, by disadvantaged communities? Uh, sure, so thanks so much. So the, so the question, you know, focusing on you know, what kind of telehealth policies actually took place in the context of the pandemic to increase access to care. And, and I, I'd say, you know, in some ways, part of the reason I'm, you know, lingering on, on this form of data presentation through Johns Hopkins is understanding this already as a form of a pivot, right? So that the, uh, the, the, the challenge at the outset of recognizing um, that, that telehealth, was in the early months of the pandemic accentuating disparities is something that you know local institutions did work on developing responses so you know this kind of data is a second order data which is to say you know initially just like initially in the early early weeks early months of the pandemic we have to remember that it wasn't really until april of 2020 that we began seeing reporting of covid rates in general in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of age, and in, in terms, well, age was there, but um, so that the attention to disparity required the ability to first acknowledge the potential for disparity was there. So I'd say in the first chunk of the pandemic, this idea that telehealth would be the way to help make sure that people could get care in a crisis was rolled out in a similar way in which there was really almost no attention to its, its effects on aggravating disparities. Um, certainly there has been a lot of um, forms of doubling down on flexible ways to help telehealth be available to all. So part of the, you know, this is a graphic that comes from an article that I've written with some colleagues at Johns Hopkins about the importance of audio only telehealth measures in the present moment of the pandemic, which is to say, Right now, right, we're at, we're at a moment where the, the, the declaration of non-emergency, right, this, this moment we're in in which, although, you know, we are no longer, you know, on a, in terms of the federal government in a pandemic, um, 
you know, creates a new form of a crisis in that crisis measures are being rolled back. So one of the measures that helped meaningful telehealth encounters take place to the patients that I serve in my clinic, right, or, that, or, or many of the folks who live in 21213 and 21205 was the acknowledgement that actually a, a, a telephone call could be a meaningful form of medical visit. And for the right person, although the, the goal should be to make sure that the, tele, the full telehealth suite is equally available to all parties, if there's a substantial chunk of the population through which the only means of actually getting care came through a phone call, that that phone call, even though it's an old technology, is still a meaningful technology. So right now we're at a moment in which rolling that back and taking away reimbursement for audio-only telehealth visits would disproportionately affect the residents of 21213 and 21205 and not affect the residents of 21210, right? So in a way, what I'm trying to answer your question by suggesting that this measure of allowing audio-only telehealth was already a second order response to the fact that full-on telehealth was not equally available to all, but that the erosion of that basis, right, has a, has a problem of once again, you know, creating policies that aggravate disparities. And so this is one of these areas in which I've been working with colleagues to see how to help make historical analysis and the foregrounding of the durability of old technologies of communication, even though they're relatively hidden, actually be something that needs to rise to the fore in policy making. That was a longish answer, I apologize. Uh, hello. Thank you so much for a very uh, nice talk. Um, some of these nuances which you explained in the US scenario may not apply in the global scenario, right? Uh, for example, in certain parts of the world, in major, many parts of the world, the difference is bet between having a good quality telemedicine versus zero healthcare, right? So there the quality that the nuances do not matter at all. It's, there's no gray area, just black and white. So my, uh, you have partly answered and addressed these points uh, during your answer and in your talk. But if I ask you that what are the three to five key takeaways, lessons learned from the pandemic, which we can now use as we strengthen global healthcare systems using the technology. In your opinion, what are those three to five key takeaways are in terms of technology and healthcare? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, and you're, you're putting me on the spot in a, in a wonderful way. So on the one hand, I wanna acknowledge that this, yeah, this talk that I've given is very much a, an American story of a, uh, in, a, of an imagination of, of telehealth technologies and primary care in this national basis. And there, there are very different, very important histories to be written about the imagination of telehealth in a global framework, right? Um, and there, and they, they, they mesh, right? There certainly are, there, there are American international expansions of telemedical models, which oftentimes differentiate, right? a sort of a two-tiered model of care of what is the form of care that one could consider a standard of care in a rich nation versus in a poor nation and naturalizing those distinctions, right? I, I wanna hold on to that for a moment because I think that that's been one of the persistent concerns also for telehealth in the United States, which is to say, if one accepts that providing a care, a form of care that is perhaps not as good, right? as a care that one would receive in person, but that is better than nothing, can be meaningful. Um, how does one create a, a policy in which it, it, a, a two-tiered model of care is intentionally being generated, in which one is understood to be inferior to another, and yet provided for the sake of providing an inferior model of care to populations that are naturalized as needing to receive inferior care. And I wanna point this out because I think this was some of the set of anxieties that came up around telemedicine when it first came out in the 60s and 70s and are then repeated in forms of computer oriented care or repeated in terms of AI and care in, in, in later iterations as well. Um, but I'm answering that to suggest that on, the, that on the one hand, there's an entirely different book to write about telehealth and the global imaginary. And yet some of the problems that emerge, right, in creating those tiered models very much play out in the domestic story in the United States. Um, I do think that a, a few takeaways that are important, right? One of them I was just leaning on, which is that, you know, 
the, te the, the technology itself of care delivery is agnostic as to whether it is it actually accentuates disparities or resolves them. And so the question of whether a technology can be used to reduce health disparities, whether we're talking about this in a sort of domestic space or whether we're talking in a global framework, requires some reflexive loop of measuring um, who is affected and what forms of disparities might emerge, um, and then actually following up on them. So I'm using this not just to promote my own institution at Johns Hopkins, but to suggest I, I do want to give the head of the telehealth office at Johns Hopkins some credit for recognizing that early in the pandemic, they had no sensor, right, for, atten for attending to the disparities that might be aggravated by telehealth. Um, and then hearing that critique, work to develop sensors. These are my colleagues, Helen Hughes and Brian Hasselfeld, who then work to attend to uh, this concept of health equity um, in digital health modes. And it, it, it required building both a sensor limb and then an ability to actually enact a form of change. And I think the same thing happens within um, electronic health records, which can be used to, um, to draw greater attention to forms of social disparities in the care that we deliver, or can be used, implemented in a way that accentuate those disparities as well. Um, I, I'd say another key piece of this involves differentiating what are the forms of care that that truly require presence or that require in-person presence. And I think one of the challenges in this space is that, um, you know, if we're, if we're processing what we've learned in the pandemic, um, I think all of us have experienced this in different ways. There, there's, the, there's a su substantial form of losses that came through waiting, right? I think this is particularly true in the, in the space of oncology of what it meant to actually not be able to do in-person interventions and be shunted along in time and have to deal with this problem of waiting for the presence. Um, and I think it, it really, it falls into type one and type two errors, right? So that if effectively um, care through telemediation can provide good enough care and provide a cheaper basis and an acceptable basis for more patients, then withholding that or not building systems to enable people to benefit from that creates a problem, right? At the other hand, if we identify those forms of care in which in-person presence is crucial, right, and that not having in-person presence actually, you know, generates generates some deviations, then then actually insisting on that and not providing the space for in-person care becomes a problem in its own right. And I've given you three. I think I'll work on four and five later afterwards with exception. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, when I was uh, an advisor to the Sc Scottish Health Authority for no a number of years ago, um, they were developing telemedicine, but in a system with universal access to medical services, everyone having a GP, and in a very rural area of central and upper Scotland and the Hebrides. And so I wonder if it wouldn't be worthwhile <laughs> looking at uses of telemedicine in such a setting. What I recall is that uh, it was primarily used to enable uh, people who would have difficulty getting to a clinic to be seen <clears throat> through home computers and their cameras uh, to, to, to zoom in and look at different parts of the body. I'm thinking now of the term the dermatological team I worked with, uh, and, and at low cost, uh, have, have a preliminary look and examination. So it was understood that there would not be a substitute for direct personal uh, care, nor would it be a substitute for full care, but it would be a way that a lot of, a lot of screening and preliminary assessment could and indeed was done. Do you think that would be worth looking at? So I, I think that that's a fascinating distinction you're making and I appreciate the question. So there's at least two levels of distinction to talk about. Um, on the one hand, you know, there's, the, there's the fundamental question you're asking, which is, does telehealth function on a screening basis um, and, 
and um, help to winnow out um, like those folks that actually needed to be followed up with more intensive care and therefore create a way of making um, a, a limited set of healthcare resources more broadly usable by a population and especially by populations seen as being geographically marginalized and whether it's physical geography or social geography who otherwise aren't actually getting enough access to care. Um, and I, I, think, I think that's a sensible approach um, I do think that one of the challenges, right, and I think you name it in the very beginning, is what it means to look at the development of telemedical technologies in a system that is predicated on a right to health for all through a nation state which guarantees access to care. And I, I, this, is a, this is a work that I have not done yet, but I would, and I don't think that I myself can do it as a single individual, but I would love to see a collective work on comparative and connected histories of telehealth between different healthcare contexts. Because I think some of the problems we're addressing are gonna show up in all of them, but I think others will segment out. And the Scottish NHS in imagining the Outer Hebrides as the out of the way place in which telehealth gets conceived and experimented on and developed is gonna function very differently than the, United, than the federal government of the United States in conceiving of the sovereign territory of the Tono Open Nation as an out of the way place to test out telemedical technologies meant for astronauts. And, and so those comparisons I think are quite useful. Although out of the space comes this concept of, well, how do you best make use of a promising technology that can actually meaningfully extend care to people who otherwise have a hard time getting it without then creating that two tiered model of, of degraded care that we're, that we're speaking of, right? Um, and I, I think in the later chapters of the book, specifically the last chapter, which is about the concept of an automated clinic, which is generated in the 19, in mid 1960s in Oakland by Kaiser Permanente. And I don't have, I don't think I have the image of that right now on this slide deck, but I could show you, I think I, I, I nod to it really briefly in the beginning. Um, but th this, this, last, this last chapter on the, on the automated clinic is really focusing on, um, on a, a clinic that is built around a computer. And it's a different mode of thinking with information and communications technologies to provide more delivery of healthcare beyond the, the limited presence of the physician. And chapter six really focuses on some of the limitations where all of these imaginaries where physicians and engineers believe that they can bring computers into hospitals and clinics and rationalize medicine. And that really doesn't come to pass in the first decade of computing. But the folks at Kaiser Permanente come up with the idea of taking a computer, hiding it in the center of a clinic and building a new kind of a clinic around it in which um, a patient will basically come into the front door, get a deck of punch cards, um, and then go through a series of room, each one of which corresponds to a different part of a standardized history and physical. There's a blood draw, there's urine sampling, there's a history taking room, there's a visual acuity test, there's an EKG, there's a chest x-ray, each one's a punch card. Punch cards go into a chute, wind up in the um, IBM you know, 1440 at the center, hidden in the center of insulation. By the time you've gone through the whole circuit, you, em you emerge with a computerized health profile. And Kaiser designs a test exactly on the model that you've made, which is to say, every patient that is insured through Kaiser Permanente should go through this machine, which will then sort them and sort the worried well from those that actually need to be followed up on for some specific risks from those who are actually sick. And the notion is that the technology can help to do a triage um, on, so that a larger population can then be winnowed down to a smaller population that really need to follow up. Now what happens immediately after that, 1965 Medicare and Medicaid are passed, right? 1966, this model is proposed in Congress for something that's supposed to be called Preventicare to complement Medicaid and Medicare. And the idea is that especially for marginalized populations, for the medically naive, for the newly expanded federal entitlements, and this is a very racialized form of language for talking about these people who are now getting care through Medicaid and Medicare who weren't getting medic medicine before, um, that actually these kinds of machines are the kind of care that they should get, that actually um, you should take these new people um, you know, especially disproportionately in urban areas, brown and black people, and put them through these machines so that we can more efficiently use healthcare system um, and that it would function as triage to make sure that these limited resources are being used appropriately. Now, what's interesting, and I won't linger on it right now, is that most of you have probably never heard of this, 
Um, but like the clinic lab, by the year 1970, so many parties were invested in the inevitability of this system taking hold. Um, the American Medical Association had signed off on it. All these manufacturers had built these automated multiphasic health testing suites. The market for these products was estimated to be a trillion dollars by 1980. Um, but it was based on that same principle. I'm sorry, I dilated too long on that. Erica, I see you have the microphone. Uh, thank you. I really enjoyed the talk. And I find myself, um, on the one hand, deeply sympathetic to what it feels like is a very small number of good faith actors in your story. And then on the other hand, it sort of feels like there are all of these other kinds of state actors who are, it, I mean, it reminds me in a sense of some of the Atomic Energy Commission, my friend, the atom, except for now we have my friend, the automatic automated clinic, where in fact, these, the idea of the promise of like the democratizing potential of technology for medicine is being used as cover to develop phenomenally expensive sets of equipment that are going to be used by a very small number of people. For example, the space shuttle, like I, yeah. that, that, the example of Star Pack just really struck me in this regard. So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about the actors who are potentially using this in a not good faith fashion and are, are, are deliberately mobilizing the rhetoric of democratic access to medicine through technology, basically to just make more technology because it's awesome. Yeah, so I, I think that's a fair assessment, <laughs> you know, um, and it, it's, um, it, it's something that I think is a pervasive theme throughout the book. And I think more broadly through the analysis of the history of technology that there is a way in which medical applications or public health applications of a new technology are a very convenient aura, right? To produce around a technology that is in the process of coming to being and showing its benign qualities, right? Um, when we see this, I think that we could name a number of different technological spaces in which this takes place. Um, one part in the story, which I mean, it's, it's not a surprise, right? That when we look at what um, Lockheed Space and Missile Company is doing in this space, especially in the early 70s in which the budget of NASA is being looked at very critically and aerospace contractors are feeling the pinch and recognize explicitly under the Nixon administration that they need to show the terrestrial applications of space technologies in order for space technology to keep on getting funded, that you can, you can always reach for the medical, right? And so I think that that's a common repetition in this space. One sees it also in telephony, right? That, that, medical applications were used to promote why people should get telephones. And I can show you advertisements from Bell Telephones or from British Telephone showing folks. And you know, I, I think I have actually, <laughs> this is a different advertiser. This is Camel Cigarettes, uh, you know, um, so it's Philip Morris. But effectively this idea that you should put a telephone in your house because what if an emergency happens in the middle of the night, you need to be able to call your doctor. Your doctor's there at the other end of the telephone by a telephone. And so to what extent the actual medical benefits of the telephone were really sincerely meant by Bell at that moment versus just a convenient narrative to structure the benign quality. Certainly this was the case also with the picture phone, the spectacular failure in which it was very clear to all that these, these um, you know, the, the, the medical application was what performed the basis for this new technology, which also was promised to make Bell a ton of money and then did not. Um, I think when we look at computers, it's really quite interesting because in, the, in, the, in this failure to bring computers into the clinics in the 50s and 60s, one of the most dramatic failures is called the Hospital Computer Project in this Massachusetts General Hospital, which works with um, uh, Bolt, Baranek and Newman this computing company based in Cambridge to develop this first major electronic health record to be tested out in, in, a, in, a, in a hospital, in the Mass General Hospital. Now it's really quaint, I could show you, they, they have these typewriters surrounded in wooden frames that are the teletype entities, but what BBN creates is an online computing system where the, the, the basically the, the mainframes are, are based in Cambridge 
And then they move through phone systems to create online terminals at the Mass General Hospital across the Charles River in Boston. So this comes to so the, the project, it's a technical success for BBN. It's a total clinical failure for MGH in that, that there, there's no trust that's built in the computer system and it's shut down in 68 and seen as a fiasco. But what does BBN do right afterwards? Well, they, they move on and they get on the basis of this successful online projects, they then get the contract to develop ARPANET and then come claim and develop the internet based off of this, right? So, so this is a way of saying yes, which is a shorter answer I could have given you, right? But also to sketch out that even in those spaces, what becomes a little harder to, to pick apart is um, whether it's pure false consciousness or whether the aerospace contractors and technologists themselves allow themselves to be deluded into thinking that they are also merely doing good in the world by invoking the possibility of health benefits of their technologies. And the, the answer I wanna lean on is why it is that iteratively, this can be used to generate speculative capital, right? And with no real follow-up. So that it's almost as if health being used as a promissory basis for investing in new technologies is enough. It can be invoked at the beginning. And then there's, in almost none of these cases that I'm telling you about today, is someone coming back at the end and saying, hey, those promised health benefits of your new technology, can you show us where they actually showed up? And we have an iterative process of just allowing health to lead kind of this tail that wags a dog and then not actually seeking it. And that's something I think we can change. That's a malleable space in which we can think about governance and reflexivity and what role history and sociology of science has in actually asking us to shift the governance structure and the expectations we have for new technologies. But that's one of those things that's up to us to do. Uh, thanks so much. I really enjoyed the talk and the book. Um, I, I have two quick questions that are very specific. One is about robots and the other is about space. Um, the robot question, um, I'm curious, most of the discussion is of, um, I guess what you would call some kind of sort of measurement or the, the doctors talking with patients or looking at patients, but is there, you know, I, I'm thinking about like a Da Vinci robot and surgery. Um, and is there sort of, my understanding is that typically surgeons don't do telesurgery because of the potential delays and issues that might come with that, but sometimes they'll sort of monitor a surgery, a robotic surgery or other surgery that's happening elsewhere. But I'd be curious sort of what is the current state of the field in that? What is the history of sort of telerobotic medicine surgery and what are the speculations about that? And then my second question is also on satellites and to the global question earlier. Um, my understanding is with the ATS satellites, um, I think in the book you talk about the Alaska pro program, mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned in the talk that the some of what was done within the United States was thought of as a sort of model to export abroad to developing countries. And so I know in the 70s, uh, aerospace corporations and NASA were, were looking at Canada and working with Brazil um, and Indonesia on similar projects. And I'd be curious, are there any what happened with those projects and are there any differences between what was happening within the United States, and what was happening abroad? Was it sort of exporting US medical expertise abroad or sort of creating networks for medical expertise in other countries? Thank you. So that was a great pair of questions. Um, I'm gonna be really quick on the first one, which is I don't claim to be at the forefront of telesurgery right now. Although I do regularly pass on the Hopkins campus a, teles a model telesurgical suite, which is being sort of, you know, like, very visible as, as a mode of thinking about imaginaries of where telehealth can go. But to go back to the speculative future in there, if we go to the work of Hugo Gernsbach, for example, right? So this, um, and Gernsbach is very important in understanding some of the futures for radio medicine that were perceived as possible that take place in the, sec in the second portion of the book. But Gernsbach uh, describes a, a concept of a teledactyl. And this idea, and this is described already in the 19, you know, teens and 1920s that, you know, based on the technologies that already exist in terms of possible servo technologies and remote control, that such a thing as a feedback loop to perform telesurgical encounters should be inevitable. And this is sort of this early 20th century, kind of like the Fritz Kahn illustration I showed you earlier. So there's, there's been a long history of a speculative future of telesurgery. Now there are contemporary practices of telesurgery that happen both domestically and within the global health. Space. And so I'll use that to basically to bridge and talk about the, the, you know, 
what happens with other demonstration projects for other ATS satellites and um, other federal entities that are doing projects and considering aid projects involving satellite mediated communications packages that actually are imagined um, as a part of soft power of you know, the US soft power and the extent of the Cold War. And I think these things very much do coexist. So if one goes into um, NASA archives and to, to, and to NSF archives, unpacking the grants behind these demonstration projects of satellite medicine, an entire book could be written about satellite health. And I, I limited those parts in, in this book, um, but I'd encourage you to take it on. Um, and it, it's very much an overlapping technology. And, and this is a, a refrain that keeps on coming up in the technological imagination of what one can do with technology in US medical development, which is an equation of what is happening in demonstration projects on places like the Papago Reservation Center in Arizona and what will happen in um, places like, um, uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh, um, in, um, it, it sort of equation of the, the, the sovereign, you know, Native American nations as a third world within the continental United States. And that's a phrase that actually pops up several times among technologists. Um, with a bit more time, I would talk about the, some of the strange programs that are set up to train Peace Corps volunteers um, that are set up as part of the Tono Otham Reservation. Um, and thinking that actually in many ways, engagements of rural health training through the Inter in Indian Health Service were thought to be a way of also training Peace Corps workers, these two spaces of sort of domestic and international aid, except in the case that the Indian reservation as stylized in this means, and the Papago Indian Reservation becomes renamed in the, in the IHS organization as the Office of Research and Development. Um, so there's an Office of Research and Development, the ORD of the Indian Health Service that spearheads the telemedical work among other forms of medical cybernetics. Um, and if you look at the lines of what, where the ORD is located, it is, it is the Papago um, Reservation. And so, the reservation itself is reimagined as a place of producing technological knowledge of delivering healthcare in an out of the way place that can then be exported through USAID and Peace Corps. And the same thing happens with the ATS Alaska um, health experiments and a broader ATS, this is a communication satellite pro projects that are taking place over India in particular. And so equating India and Alaska is another bridge that happens through NASA imaginations of the health benefits. Anyway, I'd love to talk more with you about that afterwards, but the short answer again is yes. Okay, it's seven o'clock uh, and I've been instructed that